Hello, noble woman. I am so excited that you're joining this fast uh, with me for the two days for um, fasting for our husbands. Um, God had told me to fast for my husband. I guess it was Saturday night, Sunday night. No, Saturday night. So Saturday night, what happened was um, there was like a series of attacks that we knew was like directed towards our family. And so like my husband, he just ain't really have nothing left. And he came into the house and he like sat on the couch and I could tell he was weary. And it wasn't that he wasn't gonna fight or didn't wanna fight, but God laid on my heart to see his tiredness. And I knew at that time that God was telling me to fast for him, particularly for two days. Now God, um, I didn't know at the time what the fast was gonna entail, like what scriptures I was gonna be standing on or things like that, but the Lord revealed it. And so for day one, um, he instructed me, as I told you, to read Jeremiah 31. And through that, what we would do is go through the scriptures and find like the different promises and um, like go through the scriptures and find the promises that God had for our husbands. Now, before, you know how like before you set out to read um, obviously the chapter, you should probably read the chapter before or the chapter after it so you can gain context on exactly um, what that scripture is about. So I set out to read chapter, uh, Jeremiah chapter 30 first, 30 <laughs> first, so that I can get a handle on what was happening in Jeremiah 31, even though I knew that's where God was telling me to go. But it, so I have my, um, my notes here because I want to share them with you because it is so good. I want to start off, um, let me pray first, and then I want to tell you about this dream. So, Father God, we come to you right now, Lord God. What I pray is that you will lead and guide us as we are fasting for our husbands, Lord God, as we search your word. I pray that you will highlight scriptures, not only in Jeremiah, Lord God, but in your whole word, uh, so that we can continue to um, stand in the gap and intercede for our husbands, for our families, for our children, Um because we know that the husbands are the head and we're called as the wives to be the help meet. So that's not only just helping them to um, bring forth ideas or visions or cook their dinner or to um, do those things. But Lord God, it's, we're also called to, to help them. When we see that there is an attack, our job and you have positioned us to be able to fight. And so what I thank you for is I thank you that you not only told me to fight for my husband and to fast for my husband and to pray for my husband over these two days, but you told me to invite these ladies to do it with me as well. So I pray, Lord God, that you bless them for their obedience. I pray that you bless them for their willingness. Lord God, I pray that they will see uh, change right before their eyes. And for those, Lord God, who may not see change right away, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will show them the work that they're doing in the spirit, that they will not um, be um, discouraged, that they will not lack, that they will not fear what they see. Because the Bible says not to worry about what is seen, but to keep our eyes on the unseen because that's what lasts forever. So Holy Spirit, be with me as I go over these notes. I pray that I want to leave room for you, that you will um, use me to just ad adequately convey not only what you're saying to me in regards to my husband's life, but Lord God, what's happening to husbands all across this world for your kingdom in Jesus name, particularly for these noble women that have joined this fast. Amen. All right. So I went to um, Jeremiah 30 so that I can get context on 31. And when I had went to 30, it just like opened up like a door, like of just um, word, encouragement, and things like that. So um, you're going to be a while. I don't know how long, but we're just going to go through it because this will be here for, right? So what I want you to do is definitely get your Bible and I want you to get something to take notes with because it's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot. But understand that everything that I'm saying that God has given me for um, my husband is really for our husbands, but he's also going to give you some unique things for your husband. So it's like, you're joining me on this fast, but that's because something in you was like, say yes. You know, something in you, I don't even think it was by chance that God had me say reply to the email saying yes. You know, because you're signing up to say yes, and it's going to radically change your marriage and your husband. So let me say about this dream. So last night I had this dream that um, Clarence had said to me in the dream. He said, Erica, um, your fast 
is going to heal places that I physically can't touch. And it was like that he physically wasn't able to reach with his own hands. And so what I believe God was telling me, and also what I'm going to just say going forward, instead of me, I'm going to say us. Is that all right? And then if it fit, it fit. If it don't, it don't. But I'm telling you it's us. Okay. So I believe that what God is telling us is that on this fast with our husbands, because even as I say, Clarence, I really mean like, so import me, you, your husband, my husband. Got it? Okay. So what I believe that God is telling us as wives is that through this fast, like remember when um, the scripture talked about Jesus and the, and the guy who had brought his son to the disciples and they wasn't able to do it. And then when, when the disciples, when the, when the father bought, um, and I'll find that too. I think that's in, um, Matthew five, I'm gonna pull it up while I'm talking, but the disciples were saying to God, um, to Jesus, they said, why wasn't we able to do it? Because the, the father was like, man, like I took, I took them to your disciples, but, um, they wasn't able to do it. And so then Jesus was able to ask a couple questions and then he was able to deliver the son. So then when the disciples saw that they went back to him and said, um, why weren't we able to do that? And then hold on one second. Um, these because jesus said these things come by fasting and praying right and so that scripture is matthew 12 i'm sorry matthew 17 and 21 right let's pull that up matthew 12 and 21 how be it this thing goeth out but by fasting and praying so jesus answered these kind of things this is the um um I'm going to read it in the New King James Version. It says, however, these things does not go out except by fasting and pr uh, by fasting, well, by prayer and fasting. And so once again, that's Matthew 17 and 21. And then um, I see another one in Mark, Mark 9, 29. And it's the same. It's the same thing. Just a different account. This is boy with the evil spirit, Mark 9, 29. And then um, the new international version says he replied, these things can come out only by prayer. And so um, I like, I like the other version because it was prayer and fasting. And so I believe that us fasting in whatever way that God is telling you to fast, whether you're doing it with me with the six to six only water, if you're doing an absolute fast, whatever fast you have put before the Lord, I believe that fasting coupled with prayer we're going to see extreme when i say extreme i mean extreme breaking coming forth in our husband's lives so um that dream confirmed that to me um it confirmed that what's going to happen as a result of this fast is going to bring forth more traction than any argument ever did mm, i feel that this fast is going to bring forth results faster, quicker, and be more effective than any argument ever did. Any conversation ever did. Jesus' name. So um, when you go to Jeremiah 30, um, the first thing it says here is, the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord and Holy Spirit. We just pray for revelation and knowledge of your word in Jesus' name. So I'm in Jeremiah 30, and this is the, um, the New King James Version. But it says, the word of the Lord came from Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, this is verse 2, Thus speaks the Lord of Israel, saying, Write in a book for yourself all the words I have spoken to you. And so um, the uh, Holy Spirit had us... <laughs> Had us make a note right there. So what I want you to do is you have to um, write a book for yourself of all the words ever spoken to you concerning your husband, your family, and your marriage. And so this is my husband's book. And I'm going to talk to you about that. This is his book. It is a like a five-star, you know, just a regular notebook. But in this notebook, I have prayers for him. Because what happened was what I found that like, so... If you follow me, you know that um, I write my prayers. Obviously, that's why you're here because you get my prayers that I write in my journal. And so what was happening was I would have one journal. And as I was setting out the right, I would be writing about myself. I'd be writing about the kids. I would write about my husband. I would write about the business. I would write about everything. And it started to get real like convoluted where I was like, they taking up too much space in my journal. And so I decided to get 
one journal for each one of my children. So that's the first thing. This is a side note. I got two side notes for you. So this is a two day fast for our husbands, right? But I also have a, the Lord told me in December to pray for my son for 365 days. So I have a 365 days prayer thing going on right now where I'm standing in the gap and interceding for my son. Um, if you want to join that, all you got to do is email me at hello at the noble woman, hello at the noble woman and put in the subject, add me to mother's prayer. Okay. Or put in an email that you want to be added to the noble mother's prayer list. Okay. And I'll add you to that, but we're going to equip. Okay. We're about to get equipped with our resources. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you as a side note to, if you're a mother, sign up for the um, noble mother's prayer by emailing me at hello, the noble at hello at the noblewoman.com. Then I want you to get a prayer journal for each one of your kids. I don't care how old they are. Um, if you're a grandmother, get them for your grandkids. I have, uh, we have 10 kids total. So I have 10 books. I have a grandson that's coming. So I got to add um, him a prayer book. So it don't matter how many you get. You can get like composition books. I got composition books from Walmart. You know, they'd be like 25 cent or 50 cent. So you can get those. Um, you can get a fancy book. You can get, like I said, the reason why his is so big, I should say it's not like a composition book is because I like that it had the, um, the sections. And so what I, my plan was to like, for each section is to write down like each area of, um, like his life. So it may be like business. It could be his heart. It could be his affections, however it works. Oh, speaking of that. So when I was looking for something to put the notes in today for the prayer, I was like, I was going to use one notebook, but I forgot that I did have his prayer book. So I said, I'm going to put it in his prayer book, right? And so the first thing you want to do is like that scripture says, um, you want to write down your husband's needs, right? So the way I describe it is, um, write down in the notebook, his issues his areas where he falls short, where he's lacking spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally, or health-wise. Understand that you are the most qualified person to contend for him spiritually, okay? And hopefully this will ease your mind and reduce any anger or um, give you some peace. So understand that in his notebook that you're going to get for him, you're going to make a list of all the things that you see that he needs spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally, and health wise, wherever he's falling short. And you can even pray into some things that you see for him in the vision. Remember, because the scripture said um, that you have, that God has spoken to you. So God may have spoken to some, to you about some things that your husband is going to become or, or there are some things that you see in him that hasn't fully came into fruition. <laughs> I don't know how long it took me. I think it might've took me 10 minutes. I want you to know. I don't even think it took me 10 minutes, but off the cuff, I sat down. This isn't this time. This is just in his notebook. I wrote 53 things that my husband needed. Let me help you just in case. I'm gonna give you some ideas. I know that if somebody said, girl, what is wrong with your husband? What does he need? Or how does he need to grow? You're gonna be able to write them down. But let me just tell you some things that I wrote. These things are not all true now because like I said, I had been praying for him in certain areas. So I have like, um, like times that stuff is answered, but I'm just gonna give you some things. Accountability, honesty, good judgment, um, good judgment, transparency, consistency, fortitude, um, that the, that the things that I'm praying for him, that they have lasting effects, a stronger relationship with God, a passion for God's word, a passion for God's way, high integrity, purity, a fresh start, deliverance from fear, a strong conviction of truth, understanding the role and actions of a good father, um, to take care of his health, to be the spiritual head of the house, to provide for our family that he will embody Titus too, that he will teach our family the Bible, that um, he will have a godly perception, prayed against depression, prayer for a hunger for prayer, wisdom, um, self-discipline, strength. And so these are just some of the things, but like I said, I was able to write, it was 50, 16, it's gonna flow from you, trust me, it's gonna flow. But that's the first thing that you wanna do, okay? So that's from Jeremiah 30. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write down the things, we're gonna get a book, and we're going to write down what 
what thus saith the Lord for our husband. This is where you can declare, you can decree all of those things. You can speak against the enemy in his life. You can see where he's being attacked. But this is going to be your battle plan. Okay. And I hope that this goes beyond two days. The other thing is, I was so glad that I had opened up this book because I totally, totally forgot that God had challenged me to pray um, 30 days of prayer for my husband. I only got to day four, but you see how I had it kind of written here, the 30 days. And I was like, I had a strong little start, but I'm glad that when God told me to fast for him, that he knew that I was going to pick up his book. And then he knew that I was going to find the thing about praying for him for 30 days. So what I think I might do is I think I might actually continue this fast for 30 days or at least do the fast for two and then continue the prayer out for 30. So if you're interested in that, let me know as well. But um, that's that. Boom. Now we're going to get into what God says. So now you got your book for him. You're going to write your list, right, of all the things that you see, his shortfalls, all of that good stuff. And then we're going to get the war. Okay. So this is what God told me. Um, in verse 3 of Jeremiah 30 and I know that we're supposed to be in 31 but we were just building some context in 30 it says in verse 3 for behold the day is coming the days are coming says the Lord that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah thus saith the Lord Um. so what God was showing me was the reason why he called me specifically to this fast. The reason why he called us specifically to this fast is because we are about to see our husbands returning back from captivity. Right? So it says, in the day, I will bring you back from captivity. So I looked at captivity. But first I looked at the word back because I like to go into the Blue Letter Bible and just uncover different words and so the meaning of the word back is to return to to come back of dying or return back to god right and so for me this is my particular season so i asked the lord for um for a word every year and my word for this year was re re which means to to do to like redo to like re again or over and so what god is telling us is that he has done a work in our husband, right? Our husband was in captivity in one way or the other, of the other, whether it was through physical bondage, mental bondage, spiritual bondage, he was bound, right? But God is now letting us know as wives that he is bringing our husbands back, right? From captivity, he is returning him back. Our husband is coming back. There's some dead things that we've seen in our husband's lives. God is like, I'm about to resurrect those things right? They're about to turn back to me in every single area of their life. So then when I looked up the word captivity, it just meant captives. So I was like, okay. And so it meant captivity or captives. And so then when he says, um, my people, my people was my nation, kingsmen, our countrymen. And I have a prayer, which I think I'm going to send out, which is the um, prayer of the noble wife for her husband. And in that prayer, I specifically say, he is your countryman. And God gave me that word that long time, but now God is identifying and saying, your husband is my people. He is my kingsman. He is my nation. All right. So God is bringing our husbands back from captivity. He's bringing your husband back from captivity. And captivity is, so when I look up the, diction, um, the dictionary, it says the condition of being imprisoned or confined. Similar words to captivity is imprisonment. So what God is saying is that your husband, he will no longer be a slave to sin. So there is a scripture that says, um, I wanted to make a note to go back because I'm going to be, we're going to be building a prayer, right? And the prayer that I'm building from this lesson of Jeremiah 3 I'm sorry, Jeremiah 30, Jeremiah 31, and then other scriptures throughout this. This is going to be a whole prayer that I'm going to um, build, type up, and then I'm going to send out to you. But also, remember I said in, in um, Jeremiah 31, God wants you to be looking 
through and pulling out promises, but don't just be limited to Jeremiah 31. I want you to go throughout the scriptures and I want you to almost like grocery shopping. Like God has taken us and said, not even grocery shopping, say shopping spree. And God has said, everything that you see in here, I want you to pull it and I want you to take it. And I want you to, you know, add it to him so that we can partner with God. And God is actually partnering with us. That's a privilege. Let's say that. For God to partner with us is a privilege. So God is partnering with us as we are interceding for our husbands. And so, um, no longer a slave to sin. That's what I always do. Whenever there's a verse that comes to mind, I don't really necessarily know where it is. I pop that thing right into Google and I'll put in the, the word that I know that the Holy Spirit is bringing to me. And it is uh, Romans 6, 1 through 7. So I'm going to actually pull apart this. And I am going to be adding a portion of this to the prayer. Okay. Um, yeah. So we're going to, we're going to um, talk about that. It says, so in verse six, right? So this is um, Jeremiah six, one through seven, but verse six, it says, we know that the persons we used to be was crucified with him and put an end to sin in our bodies. Because of this, we are no longer slaves to sin. So what I'm going to be writing as a um as a note for that for that prayer is going to come from, let me just write this down. Romans 6, chapter 6, verse 6. So Romans 6 and 6. And I'm going to say, thank you, God. I understand that Clarence, but you got to make sure you put your husband's name in there, right? That such and such, my husband, um, you like that he was crucified and that now sin has been put to an end in his body because he is no longer a slave to sin but that's one thing that that was one of the promises the other thing is this um the words that comes to mind is that he has come to set the captives free we want to get that scripture come to set the captives free And that is Luke 4 and 18. So if you can't tell this is a working session, we are breaking this thing down together. But I am, like I said, I'm going to release the things that God said to me. But there was also some things from, um, you know, that I wanted to add. So we're going to add Luke 14, Luke 4 and 18 to that as well. Because God is telling us that he is setting the captives free. Our husband at this time is represented as a captive and he is being set free. So then the word talks, um, the word captive also means confined. But what God is saying is that uh, because we're on the upswing of things that his mind, our husband's minds are going to be open. And then um, another word for captive is incarceration. So for real, for real, I feel like if your husband is physically locked up, and I mean like in the justice system, I'm believing God that through this fast and through your praying that God is going to supernaturally, um, if you have been praying for this, God is going to be releasing your husband, like your husband is about to be released, okay? Um, but for us, if it's a metaphoric or a spiritual place, understand that um, our husband's were incarcerated by sin. The Bible says that wages, the wages of sin is death, which means that when you sin, you are now subject to wages and that payment or repayment or consequence for that sin is death. But what God is saying is that obviously salvation is coming, right? And so our husbands are no longer bound by sin. They're no longer bound by the wages of death, that they are being delivered from the wages of sin. And so if for you, if you're standing in the gap for your husband's salvation, because obviously you don't want your husband to go to hell, but if you're standing in the gap and you know that your husband is not a believer in Christ, understand that during this fast, God is going to bring salvation to your husband. And I just want to make a note of this, even if it doesn't look like it. So let's say after these two days or as you're going through these two days, stuff may look different than what you're declaring, what you're seeing, what I am saying, thus saith the Lord, or what God is specifically telling you. But do not be discouraged, okay? And even if it does look like it, what I'm saying is we're not going to keep our mind. The Bible says not to focus on what is seen, but focus on what is unseen because that's what, that's what lasts forever. And the last word um, for captivity or captive is custody. 
And what God is saying is that your husband, that our husbands are now in his custody. I got excited about that. Our husbands are now in his custody. So what that means is if they are not captive, right? If God has set them free in verse, so in Jeremiah 30, right? Verse three, I will bring back from captivity my people, Israel and Judah. That means that our husbands are no longer, and this is the scripture that he gave me to go to. And I want you to go here too, because I have it um, written down, but I want to um, also pull it up. It's John 8 and 34. John 8 and 34. And while you're pulling it up, I'm about to get something to drink. Hold on one second. Okay, water. So John 8 and 34, I'm sorry, I said 37. It's um, John 8 and 34. And it says, Jesus answered them, very, very, I say unto you, everyone who has committed sin is a slave of sin, right? So, um, let me do it in the, it must've been, that was in the New King James Version. This is the New King James Version. Jesus answered, and most assuredly, I say unto you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin, right? But what I, what I found that Jesus was saying was, remember, he said that God said that he was coming to set the captives free, which means our husbands are no longer slaves to sins. So I put here, I can't remember. I don't know what this word was. I can't, I can't read my handwriting for Clarence is no longer safe to sin. I think it's, I said rejoice. That's what I think I said. So we just gonna rejoice that our husbands are no longer slaves to sin. And then when we break this down, truly, truly, that word is broken down in the, um, in the blue letter Bible. It means verily, verily. And verily, verily means firm, faithful, amen. It is so at the end, it may be fulfilled. So understand that verily, verily, Jesus is saying to us that our husbands, it is firm, it is fixed, it is so, it is fulfilled. They are no longer slaves to sin, which means he will, he is not going to die in the state that you see him in. He is not going to die in that state. Hallelujah, I wrote. And then I said, thank you, Jesus, for setting Clarence free. So you're going to say, thank you, Jesus, for setting your husband free. Okay. Put his name in there. Thank you for your salvation plan for him. So I wrote that in there because that's going to be going in there. Thank you that he is no longer a slave, a bondsman or a servant of sin. So then I was writing right here. So then there was like the breakdown of, um, what sin is. And so then I just wanted to um, declare some things. So he will no longer live a life of habit, live a life habitually missing the mark. Without share in your godly inheritance, which is salvation, goodness, gladness, peace, joy, grace, temperance, love, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He will no longer wander from the path of uprightness or he will no longer wander from the path of uprightness and honor or from your law to do wrong, to offend or to live a sinful life. So these words are going to be in the prayer, but that's what God was showing me in the scriptures is that those days are now behind them. And so in the blue letter Bible, so this is verse 35 of John. So of John 8, 35, let's go to that. John 8 and 35. You want to read it? <laughs> John 8 and 35 says, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. So what God was showing me in that one right there is that if our husband, you like that I say your husband, our husband, or my husband? I'm gonna say your husband. Okay. So 
if your husband is no longer a slave, then the only other option is for him to be a son. And so when verse 37, it says, slaves, which we already know our husbands are not, your husband is not, will not abide in the house forever. However, a son will abide in the house forever. A son abides forever. And remember, that's because the promise that we just heard, which is the promise of salvation that he is now going to receive, has received, or will, or will walk in the fullness of, right? So it says, your husband, put your husband's name in there. Your husband is your son. So we're going to pray this. We're going to say, God, my husband is your son. Now with him being God's son, it entitles him to some things. So when you go into the Blue Letter Bible and you look up the word son, right? In verse 35, this is what it means. It means that our husbands, your husband, my husband is entitled to God's love, his protection, and for other benefits. Those benefits are the ability for him to see God's character as a loving father. So this is why this is important. It's because for people who don't know God, Satan tells them that the things that God does is wrong. That So like when they receive chastisement, when they receive correction, um, when people are not loving God or looking at God's love, they look at God's love as this insulting or like it's bad. And so because now your husband is a son of God, he has the ability to see God as a loving father. And then the next one says, one of the benefits is the right to be shaped by his chastisement. Chastisement is good. Chastisement is a right of a son. The Bible says that um, God says that he chastises those that he loves. And so if depending on the state in which your husband is in, he may view God's chastisement as bad, as as um, as um not being loving, as not being kind, as God, you know, having a problem with him. And so um, we're going to go to Hebrews 12 verses 5 through 8 now. And so when you go to Hebrews 12, I think I'm going to go there. Yeah. Hebrews 12. 5 through 10, right? Hebrews 12, 5 through 8. This particular section, right, when you get to verse 5, this is under, um, in the Dakes Bible, it's like a little small little piece over verse 5, and it says, the father's chastening not to be despised. Because I remember I told you, um, those that are not of God despise the father's chastening. But this is what it says. It says in verse 5a, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, right? And so, um, let me read my note right here. Now this, right. So now what we're showing with this scripture is showing us is how God addresses his sons. Because God says, my sons. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord. So what he's saying is, my son. Now, if you was a slave, you would have despised it. But he's saying he's, he's helping to change their mentality. He's saying, like, as a son, don't despise my chastening. Don't be discouraged when I rebuke you. So what I wrote for the prayer, and like I said, this line will be in the prayer that will be sent out to you. I thank you, Father, that he will no longer despise your chastening, nor will he be discouraged when you rebuke him. Think about that. Think about all the times that as wise we've been praying or as you live in your life, as your husband's living his life, God has been trying to correct him saying, no, this is the wrong way. No, do not live life that way. No, look at my word. And because they was a slave to sin, they viewed that as limiting, as hurt, as um bad but we thank the lord that our prayers are being answered that when we said god open his eyes he's now seeing god clearly thank you lord okay so verse seven i'm sorry verse six says for whom the lord loves he chastens and scourges i think that's the word s c-o-u-r-g-e-s i got a good friend that's gonna be watching this and she be helping with my pronunciation so What's the word? I'm a, I'm a Texas too. I'm gonna call after this answer. But anyway, I'm gonna use the word. I'm gonna say scourges, right? Every son whom he rejoices. So I didn't know what that word meant. So what I realized is scourges. And if I'm saying it wrong, just be with me. <laughs> it says, 
a whip used as an instrument of punishment. Okay. And then the word chasten. So we're going to, we're going to break it down first. So for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So chastens is for whom the Lord loves, you now have access. Chasten means chasteneth. And the word chasteneth in the Blue Letter Bible means training, instruction, teaching, correction. Those whose characters are molded by reproof and add, this is another word that's going to trip me up, admonish. I think the word is like admonish, but it's admi admonition. Okay, but admonition, because listen, when you when you read the Bible, I'm gonna encourage you, that is what I do. Don't just look at words for face value. If you don't know the word, look it up. If you do know the word, get the blue letter Bible and then see what the word means. If it's in the old testament, it's gonna be in the um Hebrew. If it's in the New Testament, it's gonna be in the Greek. You wanna see because us if we speak English, we have a certain connotation or context of what we think a word means when it could mean something else in a whole different language. But I want to go ahead and I'm, we're going to break this sentence down, this verse down right here, verse six. For whom the Lord love, he chastens. So what this is saying is for whom the Lord loves, which is our husbands, he gives them now access to his training, to his instruction, to his teaching, to his correction. We don't need nothing else, y'all. We didn't hit the jackpot. Like this is it. The Lord is saying like, Finally, I am bringing them out of captivity. And once they're out of captivity, where are they going to? They're going to his chastening. And God is saying, and in this time, don't despise it. Mm. In this time, don't be discouraged. They're going to his rebuke. And in this time, they're going to love it. So don't, don't be discouraged. And we're not, this is what we're not going to do. I don't know. I just feel in my spirit. It could be me. It may be you. But this is what we're not going to do. As we are watching the Lord deal with our husbands, as he's bringing them out of captivity, there are going to be some ways that they went wrong that are going to be made right. They're going to come out of their mouth and say, you know what? I think I've been doing this wrong. I've been doing this wrong this whole time. Or they're going to completely stop a behavior that was tearing the family up. Right? They're going to now find deliverance and salvation from a sin that was so easily besetting them. We cannot. I'm closing my eyes because I, this is deep, but I, I only want you to think I'm looking at you. But I'm saying this for me too. We cannot be like I told you so. Do not be a hard place to land. Do not be a record of wrong keeper like, oh, but what about this? You know, like we know, we're going to let the Lord do his work. We don't know how, we don't know the journey. God has given us a glimpse into what's going on, but he has not given us a glimpse into the time frame. And that's important. I'm just realizing that myself. Yes, we know we're fasting for two days. We're fasting for this work. God is telling us what's going to happen in this time, but we don't know how long the journey is. And it ain't on us to put a time frame on it anyway, but let me keep on going. So your, our husbands are going to be, your husband is going to be molded in character by God's reproof and, and admonition, which means counsel and warning. So now there's going to be a time where before you may have noticed that, listen, it was like road work out there and it was like, do not enter. And your husband was like, sounds about right. Let me gear up and went right through it. He ain't going to do that no more. Mind you, and don't forget, I told you earlier, if you still see him doing it, understand that he's not going to be doing that no more. Don't worry about that. It's going to say danger, danger, danger. He's going to be like, oh, that's danger. He's now going to be able to clearly see the warning and the counsel of God. He is going to literally be sitting at the table for hours, soaking himself in God's word. And not only soaking himself in God's word, but he's going to allow it to enter his body. And he's going to be saying it out of his mouth to the family. He's going to be allowing the word to get into his joints and to his marrows and to his bones. And he's going to start living it. And if he's already living it, he's going to be living it to a higher degree. Don't forget the dream. The dream said there's, there are places and there's accesses, there's positions, there are things that he's wanted. There's dreams, there's hopes, there's goals. And at his best attempts, he couldn't reach it. And he's going to know that through your fast, you were able to get things as you partner with God for places that his hands were never able to reach. And I thank you for that, God. Mm. Thank you, God. So 
I put a prayer here that said, thank you that he now has access and ability and willingness to receive and apply your training, instruction, teaching, and correction. Thank you that he is, that his character is being molded by your counsel and warning and admonishment. Now the Bible says, remember the scripture, when we go back to verse six, it says, and scourges, he whips and used as an instrument of punishment, every son whom he receives. We're going to look at that word receives. So the word receives in the blue letter Bible, if you still with me, which you should be, we're in Hebrew 12 verse six now. And we're looking at the word receives in the blue letter Bible. So what I did was, um, I took every word that um, received meant which it meant receiving, it meant admitting, it meant finding, it meant acknowledging, it meant delight. And so I worked that into the prayer. So what I said was, thank you for receiving him and taking him up because in the Bible it meant taking up. That's what that word meant. So Thank you for receiving him and taking him up as yourself. So what it meant was that when God says that he is receiving, what he's saying is that I'm taking this thing on as if it's me, as if it's mine, as if it's me. I'm carrying it as if it's mine. But that's why the Bible be like telling the husbands to love their wives as they love their self. Now I believe that now that I just said that, that um, if, if that's it, two things, if that's something that your husband is struggling with, if he's struggling with loving you as he loves himself, then I want you to put that in your prayer. So love your wives. I'm putting this in Google. Love your wives as Christ loves the church. That's important. So that's going to be Ephesians 5 and 25, right? Um, which I think is probably a lot of stuff in there. Um, you want to add that line to your actual prayer for your husband's. Love your wife as you love yourself. That scripture is, um, it's all of that. So in your, in your thing, and I'm, I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually add it too. So we're going to do Ephesians 5, 28 and 33. Okay. And I know that this is going on 42 minutes now. So this is almost like we've been on the phone for about an hour. So I'm going to try to hurry up because I know you probably got some stuff to do, cook food. Get stuff together before your husband come home. All that good stuff. So either you watch this later or you watch it now. But um, let me get moving. All right. So um, thank you. Thank you that he. Okay. So then I forgot where I was. Oh, when it talked about receiving. So when it said that he receives our husbands, that he's taking them up as he is doing to himself is because he is officially a bride of Christ. And so as the bride of Christ, what it's saying is that Jesus is loving our husbands as he loves, excuse me, as he loves himself. Okay. And so receive, right? So thank you for receiving him and taking him up as yourself. Thank you for admitting Clarence, which you want to put your husband's name in there and not rejecting him. Thank you for finding and deeming him acceptable in your sight. Thank you for acknowledging him as your own. Because receiving is taking some person on or taking a thing on as their own. The other one, thank you that he delights in your word, in your ways, and in your correction. Because remember, there was a time when he may not have done that because he was in captivity and he was slave to sin. Hold on. All right. There was a time when he may not have done that because he was a slave to sin. But now we want to thank God that he no longer thinks that way. So then I was looking at the word um, scourge, which led me to Isaiah 53 and 10. So let's bring that up because remember, now that our husbands are being shaped by God's character, and he is a son, it brought me to how, like God is really excited for discipline he loves it and he he does it because he loves us and so when i saw scourge 
Ah, I can't wait to hear what this word really is. But scourges, a whip used as a pun as an instrument of punishment. It remind me of Isaiah 53 and 10 that said, Yet it pleased the Lord, Yahweh, because Lord is in all caps, Yahweh, to bruise him, Christ. He has put him to grief. I'm going to pull that up. Um, because it always, like, it always stuck with me. Like, the Lord has had me in this scripture for a minute. Um, I'm going to do it in the, um, I'm going to do it actually in the New Living Translation. Let me pull it up. Let me pull it up. Thank you too for hanging here with me. And I know I said it earlier, but I really do thank you for, for doing this fast with me. I really, I, I, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, so it says, uh, this is verse 10, Isaiah 53, verse 10, New Living Translation. But it was the Lord's good pleasure to crush him. And to cause him grief. It was the Lord's good pleasure to crush him and to cause him grief. He's talking about Christ, but it's going to also happen with our husbands. So then verse 7, um, back to Hebrews 12. Now we're in verse 7. says, if you endure chastening... God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? So if you endure chastening. So now we're going to look up the word chastening in the Blue Letter Bible. The word chastening in the Blue Letter Bible meant the whole training and education of children. Relating to the cultivation of the mind and morals. This is so good. So what God is saying, and if they endure, if our husband, if your husband endures the whole training as it relates to the cultivation of his mind and of his morals, this will include the training and care of the body. How many of us have husbands who have bad habits concerning their body, the way they eat, the way they sleep? The way they push their bodies really, really hard. But the Lord, thank you, God. I'm so excited. The Lord is even delivering workaholics, alcoholics, pill users, pill poppers, um, drug addicts. The Lord is training them on how to properly care for their bodies. And we thank you, God. And we stand in this moment and we, and we thank you. And we come into agreement and say that every husband who is drug addicted, and for that matter, every wife who has used alcohol, drugs, or um, witchcraft, control, or manipulation to bear through this time, we rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus and we declare her to lay it down. Adam is in the building. The captives is being set free. And so for every husband who through this time has used video games, depression, suicidal thoughts, masturbation, pornography, perversion, um, fornication, um, adultery, Illicit sexual acts, drugs, illegal activity, weed, cannabis, whatever you want to call it, has used these ungodly things to harm their bodies, to inflict self-hate, to numb them of the pain of the bad decisions, or have been tied up. We thank you, Lord, that you have released those things in Jesus' name. We thank you that the captors are being set free. And anything that I haven't listed, Lord God, we thank you for it, that you have covered it all in your blood. And so once your husband sees properly, he will arise as the, even the spirit of religion. I, I heard that just now where husbands are reading the word, but they're not, they don't have God's spirit behind it. And so they have held people to the letter of the law, but they're missing. It's, it's, it's that. I'm not going any further on that. Okay. Once he sees properly, he will arise as the disciplinarian of his children. This was good. I didn't even think the Lord was going to go here with this. So what God is saying is that once he does a complete act, 
a complete work on your husband's mind to now accept his discipline, your husband is going to also become a good father. And he is going to begin, and not to say he was a bad father, but he's, remember, his character is now being shaped by God. He is going to begin to love discipline. So I don't know if you have any husbands that's in the house that refuse to discipline the kids. He refuses to correct the kids. It reminds me of God brought to mind um, the father who refused to correct um, the sons of Eli. I'm not going to go into it, but I am going to pull it up so that you can have it um, for your to read. Um, sons of Eli. And this is um, 1 Samuel 2, 12 and 36. And I want you to read that. And if you read that, um, what you'll find is that um, Eli's sons had not only a lack of discipline, but they had no regard for the Lord. And he was a priest. So Eli refused to correct his sons. And so if your husband is an Eli, for whatever reason, understand that God is saying that your husband will begin to be the disciplinarian. He will arise, thank you God, as the disciplinarian of his children. And I want you guys to understand that that's just not the children that's in your house. M many of y'all, some of y'all, whoever have had husbands who have older adult children and maybe they're not your biological children or maybe they are, but you see that the lines are blurred, that the boundaries aren't set, that they're, they're giving way too much, that they're positioning themselves in, in ways. Either way, um, your husband will begin to train, instruct, teach, correct, and mold the characters of his sons and his daughters through reproof and admonishing. Okay. And I'm almost done. I'm going to be done this thing in six minutes. Be out in an hour, okay. Now I got eight minutes. Um, so it says, um, what I realized, what God showed me was when a father. So remember, the scripture said that God, being a good father, He loves chastising, right? And so, as a son, there is no training, there is no teaching. I'm sorry. As a son, there is training and there is teaching, but as a slave, there wasn't, which means that as a slave, there was a sense of fatherlessness. So what God showed me was that there, even if the father was present, he was operating in a sense of fatherlessness if he was refusing to correct his kids. So what I said was, which is going to be in a prayer, which you're going to pray too, is we come against the spirit of fatherlessness. Even if there is a father present in the home or whether your husband has grown up with the father or not, we'll come against that spirit. So this is the prayer. He will be present in the home and he will be willing and loving and encouraging and engaging with his sons and his daughters with the strength of not only a father, but with the strength of the father, which is God in Jesus name. Amen. And God gave me this word as well. He said that wayward children will live, will, it says live up as a result of this fast will live up. I don't know what I meant to say there. Wayward children will live up as a result of this fast. Um, we'll see about that. But basically, wayward children will be coming back and um, or will rise up. They'll like be better. And then it says the correction of the ungodly. Oh, because for the wayward children that the husbands were going to begin to rise up and they were going to correct the ungodly behavior um, that was flourishing, okay? It says, God told me to say, God will remove the strain of the lack of attentiveness and willingness um, of the fathers that the mother was carrying. And so what he was saying was that um, as women, if your husband was not being attentive to the children or not being a disciplinarian, there was a load that came with that and that God saw your load and that he was going to begin to remove that strain off of you. And it says for them to see their children properly. So now God is going to allow them to, the eyes are going to fall, the scales are going to fall off, right? And now they're going to see their kids properly. And God told me to say, gone is the day of he or she is fine. And what that was is when you go to your husband and you say, look at what this child is doing. Look at what this child is, whether it's the son or whether it's the daughter, particularly for the son. He says, oh, he's fine. He's fine. 
or if it's the daughter, she's fine. And um, God said that, um, or that the child can do no evil in the father's sight. And so many, you know how we have the saying where it'd be like, she got him wrapped around her finger. Or she can't do no evil in her dad's sight. Like, no, 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 no. That's not godly. God said, that's not godly. It's not godly. It's not godly for a parent to not be able to see their child's wrong. It's um, it's ungodly for a parent, for a father not to correct his children. So no longer is it going to be cute that this child, this girl has her father wrapped around her, her finger. Mm -mm. Later on tonight. I will be sending out, well, you'll probably get this at the same time, but for right now, I'll be sending out the prayer, um, which will have the scriptures that I told you as I was working and studying that will, what we went over today, like in this thing, when I just talked to you, but also about Jeremiah 30, because, um, there's some promises in there that I'm building the prayer on and, um, that's it. And whatever else God leads me to add into this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Also, if you have any questions or um, if you even see any breakthrough within this time, please email me. I would love to hear about it. You have my email address, but um, email me at hello at the noblewoman.com. I would love to hear the progress. Also, um, I would say prayer requests. But I believe that if you're doing this well, which is you, you want to get your husband a book. Um, one of the questions that I did get was, should I let my husband know that I'm fasting for him? Um, which was a really good question. So my husband does know that I'm fasting for him. Um, so I would say if you want to, you can totally let him know. He may find it to be encouraging. So um, it's up to you. Another thing was um, just making sure that you follow this as a blueprint, but also understand that you, God is, is calling you to stand in the gap for your husband. And so you're going to be able to do that. And what I would also say is in this time, we want to make sure that as wives, if there was an issue as you were going into this fast with your husband, or let's say there was arguing or there was an issue or um, whatever the case is, um, one thing that's going to be really good throughout these two days is no arguing. Don't bring up issues. Put it in his book take it to the Lord. I want you to be kind. We're going to be loving. We're going to be sexual. We're going to have sex with our husbands. Um, if, if it arises, like, let's say you was in a, in a, in a, and it was like an argument and for whatever reason you were withholding yourself, we're going to lay that down today. Okay. We're going to, um, open ourselves up to God. We're not going to use our bodies as a means to show that we are discontent. We're going to trust God that he is the resolver of the issue. Um, so Lord God, I thank you for your time. I thank you for this time. Lord God, what I want to pray is that anything that, um, I said that was within myself, Lord God, that you will straighten that out. I pray that everything that was said, that was, um, that you, um, had me to say, Lord God, that you will speak to the women. This is my fish and this is my bread. These are the loaves, Lord God. And I pray that you will multiply it and magnify it and speak to every woman, every wife, every husband, every home, transform it for your glory in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Bye.